Hey, Dr. Wilson here. I'm a structural and molecular biologist, and a few months ago, I debunked Plandemic, a conspiracy documentary that went viral across the internet. And today, it's time for me to debunk Plandemic 2. Yep, they made a part two, and it's just as bad as the first one. Also, this new documentary is an hour and 15 minutes long. God dang. But I watched the whole thing and debunked it for you so that you don't ever have to watch it. Let's get started. Judy Michaelvitz is one of the most honest, caring, and courageous women I've ever known. Why then would the most powerful forces of big tech, politics, media, and medicine go to such extreme measures to silence her voice all over the world? And why did all of the debunkers invest so much ink and airtime defaming Dr. Judy's character while avoiding very real revelations pertaining to patents, conflicts of interest, and the deadly corruption pervading our global health organizations? Well, because your documentary and Judy's story is so full of misinformation, lies, and half-truths. And those lies are dangerous, especially in a pandemic that has killed almost 900,000 people worldwide. That's why I still go through so much effort to make sure that these documentaries are debunked. What do you have to say to the people who have tried to minimize your involvement with HIV by stating that you were at the bottom of the totem pole 13th author of a 13-member group of scientists? <laughs> well, the 13th author is the senior author, so that means they're the most important author. I mean, honestly, the very first thing that Judy says in this new documentary is a lie. Let's go ahead and look at her publication record. This information is freely available just by going to PubMed and typing in Judy Mikovitz's name. As we can see, all of the papers that have HIV in the title Judy is not listed last as an author, which means that she is not the senior or corresponding author. There's one paper here that has her listed last, but if we click on it, she's not the corresponding author. Now, just to be clear, the fact that she's not a first author in any of these papers doesn't make her a bad scientist. I just think it's important to point out all of the little white lies that are told throughout this whole documentary. Why did you agree to retract your own XMRV paper? The paper was actually force retracted. I was actually being held in jail. So here's what really happened. Judy was arrested and held in jail for five days because she was accused by her employer of stealing confidential lab notebooks and information from the lab. She was released after negotiations with her employer and the lab notebooks were returned. Then about a month later, Science Magazine retracts this paper that they're talking about, which I go into more detail in the original Plandemic debunked videos. But her and only two other people on the paper disagreed with the retraction. Everybody else on the paper agreed to retract it. It was retracted because other scientists couldn't replicate her work, and they were finding evidence that it was due to just lab contamination. Then, a year later, Judy herself participates in a study that was the final nail in the coffin to prove that this work means nothing. That's it. There's no conspiracy. There's no insidious plot to hide some secret. It's just Judy made mistakes in her science and got caught for it. That's it. That's all the time that this documentary spends on Judy Mikevitz. But what they move on to is just as full of misinformation and is just as poorly researched. Let's listen. In 1999, patents on coronavirus started showing up. And thus began the rabbit trail. Let's get this out of the way. Coronavirus is a family of viruses. This new pandemic virus is a coronavirus, so a lot of people are just saying the coronavirus. But it's a family, just like influenza viruses, noroviruses, etc. These patents that he's talking about are on coronaviruses that were genetically engineered in order to be studied in the lab in a particular way. It's nothing nefarious, and most of them are just the common cold virus modified in a lab. In 2003, the Center for Disease Control saw the possibility of a gold strike, and that was the coronavirus outbreak that happened in Asia. They saw that a virus they knew could be easily manipulated was something that was very valuable, and in 2003, they sought to patent it. And they made sure that they controlled the proprietary rights to the disease, to the virus, and to its detection, and all of the measurement of it. Not quite. The CDC didn't make a bunch of money by patenting the 2003 SARS coronavirus. 
it just patented it so that other people couldn't monopolize it and hold all the research to themselves. Plenty of people did research on the 2003 SARS coronavirus. We know that Anthony Fauci, that Ralph Barrick, that the Center for Disease Control and the laundry list of people who wanted to take credit for inventing coronavirus were at the hub of this story. What is with this desire to make Anthony Fauci look like some evil villain? His name is not listed anywhere on a single coronavirus patent. And these patents are not for the invention of coronavirus. Therefore, discoveries of coronavirus and genetic manipulations of coronavirus. He's just going to get everything wrong, so get used to that. From 2003 to 2018, they controlled 100% of the cash flow that built the empire around the industrial complex of coronavirus. There is no empire on coronaviruses. Even the 2003 SARS coronavirus outbreak didn't really pick up much steam in the scientific community. After the outbreak ended, not many people wanted to fund studies of it because it didn't seem like it was a threat anymore. Not only would it have been a poor business decision to try to monopolize the coronavirus research market, but it didn't make the CDC any money anyway because that's not why they patented it. On April the 25th, 2003, the U.S. Center for Disease Control filed a patent on the coronavirus transmitted to humans. Under 35 U.S. Code Section 101, nature is prohibited from being patented. Either SARS coronavirus was manufactured, therefore making a patent on it legal, or it was natural, therefore making a patent on it illegal. This is so dumb. The Myriad Genetics lawsuit that made natural genomes unpatentable didn't happen until 2012. The SARS-2003 coronavirus outbreak happened in 2003. So back then it was legal to patent natural viruses, but now it's not, which is why COVID-19 is not patented. However, it is still legal to patent modified or synthetic genomes. So if someone has a coronavirus in a lab and they change a few bases of its genome, then that is patentable. But when the heat gets hot in 2014 and 15, what do you do? You offshore the research. You fund the Wuhan Institute of Virology to do the stuff that sounds like it's getting a little edgy with respect to its morality and legality. The Wuhan Institute of Virology was funded so that they could study SARS coronaviruses at the source, which are bats in China. That's what they did. They tracked coronaviruses and studied their spread. No projects from that grant involved manipulating coronaviruses. Early in this pandemic, I did not think the coronavirus was a natural occurrence from bats. I feel quite convinced that this was a laboratory designed organism. Why? I was particularly interested in a paper that came out in Nature Medicine by five scientists claiming and it was definitely a natural occurrence rather than a lab construct. But the arguments they used did not hold water. They didn't really make a lot of scientific sense. Why does it not make scientific sense? When it's obviously illogical, you know, doesn't hold water, somebody must have made them publish this and somebody must have told these other people that they have to say it's, it's a great piece of science. Why is it not a great piece of science? You would think that if they had convincing evidence or proof that this virus was manipulated, that's what they would talk about in this documentary. But no, it's just this woman and a few other people saying it is without any reason. We know 100% this virus was not made in a lab. That's because we have fully sequenced its genome and we see no evidence that it was manipulated, which would be there if it was manipulated. See, the problem with all of this is the evidence is right in front of our face. And when confronted with evidence, we are told fact checkers are somehow transcendent. The next literally 15 minutes of this documentary is just a lame campaign to try and discredit fact checkers. Basically, they're saying all of media is untrustworthy, therefore you can believe us. 
Except the one problem with that is as a scientist, I don't listen to the media. I look at the data and read scientific journals. And unfortunately for them, the scientific journals disagree entirely with what they say. Last Week Tonight with John Oliver featured a skit entitled Coronavirus Conspiracy Theories. It's like the claim that the moon landing was faked. First thing to note here is that Mr. Oliver opens with commentary about conspiracy theories that are completely unrelated to coronavirus. This is a standard tactic used by propagandists to set a tone so that anything that follows will be seen through the lens of absurdity. The number of times this documentary does that exact thing shows me that they have zero self-awareness. Mr. Oliver then attempts to debunk the idea that a beach, aka nature, holds any value in boosting our body's natural immune system. Instead of challenging the point with science, he kills it with a smear. Everything that you just said is insane! then offer evidence to the contrary. What Judy said was insane. She basically said that there are healing microbes in the water and in the sand, so go to the beach. And again, what are you gonna do? Rub sand on your body or drink salt water? How is that gonna heal you? Television is not the truth, Bougin! This part of the documentary is brought to you by boomers and 14 year olds who think they're really deep. In 1979, the world decided that we needed the Bayh-Dole Act because we needed to reform our patent system. And one of the modifications was we allowed recipients of federal funding to patent and retain economic interest in the research that the public paid for. You get a $5 million grant from the taxpayer, and then you get to charge the taxpayer a premium for the technology they paid to develop. What the Bayh-Dole Doll Act actually did was it allowed nonprofit organizations like universities to retain patents on things that they produced while doing research that was funded by federal dollars. It actually spurred a lot of innovation and progress within the scientific fields. The problem of pharmaceutical companies charging a premium for products that the taxpayers ultimately paid for is a much older problem than this law. By the way, that is a legit problem, and I agree that it is totally unfair that pharmaceutical companies get to charge us so much for things that taxpayers paid for. But again, it's a separate problem from the Bayh-Dole Act. Our first red flag came out when we read the World at Risk scenario. I'll link to this document in the description, but it's a pretty boring read. It's basically saying, hey, this is a threat and we should be prepared for it. Now, there is an organization called the Global Monitoring Preparedness Board. This organization is a part of the World Health Organization, and this board includes Dr. Elias from the Gates Foundation and Anthony Fauci from NIAID. These two individuals, plus the director of the Center for Disease Control in China, come out with a recommendation that says that by September 2020, two global pandemic preparedness exercises have to be completed. And one of them has to be done on the release of a respiratory pathogen. So they're asking the world to be prepared for a new deadly respiratory pathogen, which has been recognized as a threat to public health for decades, if not centuries. This shouldn't be surprising to anybody. Event 201 took place five months before COVID-19 was declared a pandemic. The participants of the event are some of the same people that are now deeply involved in the real pandemic and profiting from it as well. Event 201 was a scripted, multi-camera live event that was broadcast globally via the internet. So what was the plan here? Let's simulate this realistic scenario that is actually a threat to the world and then plan to do it just a few months after we publicly air this practice run that we did to the world? How is that a plan for world domination? I don't, I don't get it. I'm curious, who wrote the Event 201 script? It tells you right on their website. It's mostly doctors and scientists from Johns Hopkins University. You know, experts in this kind of thing. The World Health Organization is the institution granted exclusive power to guide and protect the health and wellness of humanity. The WHO is sustained by private donations, the bulk of which are made by pharmaceutical and biotech corporations who have a vested financial interest in the organization's support. 
The Gates Foundation is the second largest donor to the World Health Organization, with number one being the U.S., but only 2% of the WHO's total budget actually comes from the private sector. So that's another little lie that this documentary is trying to slide right by you. The WHO's repeated issuing of inaccurate and bad advice is not merely the result of incompetence, but rather the direct result of the Communist Party of China deliberately buying out WHO's leadership. Here is a ranked list of the WHO's donors. China is very low on the list, so I don't think they're the ones buying out the leadership. About 40 or 50 years ago, pharmaceutical CEOs actually went to jail if they knowingly sold a bad product and concealed information about the problems with that product. Since then, all they have done is paid fines. Wrong again. There are plenty of recent stories of pharmaceutical CEOs being caught for federal crimes and then serving jail time. John D. Rockefeller is duly credited as the founder of the pharmaceutical industry and the reason that medical error is currently the third leading cause of death in America. That is a myth. Medical errors are not the third leading cause of death in the U.S. There is one research paper that says that, but since then other researchers have done follow-up studies and concluded that the number required for that to be true is way too high for it to be accurate. Every year, the pharmaceutical industry spends at least twice the amount as big oil to influence laws, policies, and public perception. Legitimate problem, yes. Is it making the science all untrue and corrupt? No. You've invested $10 billion in vaccinations over the last two decades, and you figured out the return on investment for that, and it kind of stunned me. Can you walk us through the math? In a Wall Street essay, Bill Gates declared vaccines the best investment I've ever made. Well, there's been over a 20 to 1 return. So if you just look at the economic benefits, uh, that's a pretty strong number compared to anything else. I hope they realize here that he's talking about economic return on his investment. Bill Gates himself is not making money by donating large sums of his wealth to vaccinating more of the population. That's just not how donations work. In 1986, President Ronald Reagan signed the National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act, granting total immunity to vaccine manufacturers. Oh, this old anti-vaccine myth. Well, let's hear what he has to say about it. After a decade of lawsuits related to vaccine injuries and deaths, vaccine makers were going bankrupt. In a move to coerce policymakers, vaccine companies threatened to stop making vaccines until they could be legally shielded from liability. To this day, when someone is injured or killed as the result of an adverse reaction, it is the U.S. taxpayers that pay for the damages. Here's what really happened. Vaccines are ridiculously expensive to make. I'm talking billions of dollars and years of time invested just to get a vaccine to the FDA approval stage. So it's not even guaranteed to be approved at that point. So basically, it's really expensive and risky for a pharmaceutical company to even try making vaccines. And once they're made, they don't make a ton of money. You don't get very many doses before you're good for life. Pharmaceutical companies would rather make drugs that you take regularly or even every day. They make way more money on that stuff. They don't want to make vaccines. When you add to that the fact that anti-vaxxers have always been around spreading misinformation and scaring people about vaccines, you get a lot of parents who end up accusing drug companies of making vaccines that hurt their children, when in reality, that's not what happened. But courts are not exactly scientific. This means that not every decision that the judge and jury make are always going to be based on actual science. So when pharmaceutical companies end up having to pay lots of money to parents who think that their children were hurt by vaccines, they lose out on even more than they're losing just by making the vaccine. So then they say, we don't want to do this anymore. That's why this bill was signed, so that the government could take care of the people who think that their children were hurt by vaccines, and drug companies would continue making vaccines, which are really important for public health. Finally, if you actually look on the Vaccine Adverse Events and Reactions database, you can actually calculate how risky vaccines really are. We can take the number of times a client was actually awarded compensation for their claim, and divide that by how many doses of vaccines were given throughout that period. Keep in mind, not all of these compensations 
happened based on actual science. So the number is actually lower. And a lot of these compensations happened due to things like fainting or arm soreness. Nothing really serious necessarily happened. Nonetheless, if we do the calculation, we get a number that is astronomically low. So according to this Vaccine Adverse Events database that anti-vaxxers love to reference so much, your chances of maybe getting injured by a vaccine is 0.00019%. India was among the hardest hit after Bollywood celebrities were incentivized by the Gates Foundation to urge the public to submit to mass vaccinations. The next 20 minutes or so of this documentary actually made me really angry because it is so full of lies and the lies at the end of the day are only going to end up hurting children in developing countries. And that's unacceptable. In 2009, tribal children were administered the HPV vaccine. Over 24,000 girls were told they were being given wellness shots, in many cases without the informed consent of a parent or a guardian. The people that were administering these vaccines lied to the guardians of these girls and told the girls, oh, this is going to cure cancer. You're never going to have cancer. And these girls became severely injured. Some of them developed seizures. Some of them developed cancer. And seven girls died. 100% made up. This is completely untrue. The HPV vaccine that was administered to these Indian children was tested and approved before being sent there. And seven children did die, but their deaths were investigated and they had nothing to do with the HPV vaccine. Some died from things like drowning. A 2018 scientific study released in the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health concluded that over 490,000 children in India developed paralysis as a result of the Gates-supported oral polio vaccine that was administered between the years of 2000 and 2017. Here is what this slimy, lying documentary is not telling you. Before the Gates Foundation and similar efforts were present in India trying to eradicate polio, the average daily paralysis rate from polio infections in India was 500 to 1,000 children every single day. This continued until the early 1990s, when vaccines finally brought India's polio rates low and eventually eradicated it. If it weren't for those vaccines and those rates of paralysis continued, then we would have an extra over 3 million paralyzed children in India because of polio. Vaccines saved those children from that fate. This documentary is trying to not only erase that success, but reverse it by telling you that polio vaccines are causing paralysis in India. The paper they reference does find an association between the oral polio vaccine and non-polio related paralysis. However, there is also plenty of evidence to suggest that this non-polio related paralysis could be being caused by other viruses that have yet to be identified. If it does turn out that the oral polio vaccine is responsible for these cases of non-polio related paralysis, then it's likely that India would likely abandon the oral polio vaccine and move on to the injected polio vaccine, which is shown to be safer, but it's harder to transport and administer safely. Either way, it is downright disgusting to not only deny the success of the polio vaccines in India, but attempt to reverse it by spreading misinformation. This documentary is horrible. U.S.-based media and fact-checkers rushed to bury the story. But thanks to the meticulous work of a team of Indian researchers and doctors, the inconvenient truth lives on the NIH.gov website. Yeah, I know. That paper doesn't conclude what you think it says. And it doesn't support what you want it to support. But what's the plan here? The government is desperately trying to cover this up, but they're allowing the study to remain on PubMed. Vaccines were always taught to us that it was safe, it was, it was healthy, this is things that we had to do. But given the position that I am in now as a state legislator, and looking at these studies and reviewing a lot of these studies, it's very scary. And I want the African American community to open up their eyes. Vaccines are safe, and they are effective, and 
minority communities stand to gain the most from vaccinating their children more. Representative Holly, if you ever see this, I would love to talk with you about this. Of all the places that Mr. Gates could have gone in the world, why did he settle on Africa? It's not because he cares about people that look like me. He cares about an agenda. This also makes me really angry. Many African countries have a large, poor population. And as a continent with a lot of infectious diseases, those poor communities are very heavily negatively affected by those diseases. Many of them can be helped with vaccines or medications. The Gates Foundation is making an effort to bring those vaccines and medications to those communities that need them the most. Many other nonprofit organizations make the same efforts, and those efforts are sorely needed to help jumpstart these communities to the, meeting their full potential. My father was born in Eswatini, a tiny landlocked country in southern Africa. That country is one of the most AIDS-afflicted countries in the world. I've seen firsthand how many orphans are left without their parents due to diseases like HIV. These efforts being made by the Gates Foundation and others are some of the only efforts being made to bring resources that other communities take for granted to these communities that really need them and stand to benefit so much from having them available. To oppose that based on lies and pseudoscience and this agenda to vilify people who are generally trying to help is just disgusting and inexcusable. I could barely stand to watch that part of the documentary. It was so bad. There is a policy of the American government. It's called the Kissinger Report, which was produced in the mid 70s. And it explicitly states that uh, the purpose of the foreign policy in Africa was to uh, reduce the, the population. No, what they're talking about is a common phenomenon in population dynamics where when you reduce child mortality and raise living standards, population growth starts to level out. It's frustratingly ironic that vaccines and modern medicine are part of the forces that help Mickey Willis, the creator of this documentary, have the living standards and the time to make a documentary like this that is based on nothing but lies and misinformation only to try and deny other people who don't have that luxury, that same opportunity. The EPA recently approved an experimental use permit to Oxitec, a biotech company funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. In an effort to fight malaria, Oxitec will soon release millions of genetically modified mosquitoes in various US states. According to the NIH website, programs are being developed to allow human immunization via mosquito bite. It was Science Magazine that coined the phrase, flying syringes. That same Science Magazine article also said that immunization by mosquitoes is a pipe dream. It's not going to happen, it's not practical, and it's not going to happen anytime soon. The technology from Oxitec that's trying to get approved is something completely different that is only meant to reduce mosquito populations. Try again, pandemic. You keep failing. COVID-19 is the seventh coronavirus to strike mankind, and we've never found a vaccine for any of them. Yeah, people who don't understand what they're talking about with coronavirus will always say this. The truth is, we never tried that hard to make a coronavirus vaccine, but we almost did after the 2003 SARS coronavirus outbreak. But because that outbreak fizzled out and did not persist, Nobody wanted to fund a vaccine for something that was not an immediate threat. So the money literally dried up. The side effects for the Moderna vaccine sound concerning. We looked. After the second dose, at least 80% of participants experienced a systemic side effect. So are these vaccines safe? Well, the, uh, the FDA not being pressured will look hard at that. The FDA is the gold standard of regulators uh, and their current guidance on this, if they stick with that, is, is very, very appropriate. I really wish that media outlets would interview actual scientists more often than they interview rich people like Bill Gates. 
I mean, his answer wasn't really helpful. If a scientist was in that interview, maybe they'd be able to tell you that the Moderna vaccine is actually looking really safe and effective so far. It still needs to go through phase three clinical trials in order for us to be confident that it is safe and effective, but the data we have so far are not particularly worrying. And your loved ones, those that die, those that are infected, they're being used as cannon fodder, which is the ultimate desecration of their honor and integrity. Really, I think the ultimate desecration of their honor and integrity is denying the facts about what actually killed them. And not only that, but spreading misinformation and lies about the solutions to prevent more deaths like theirs. That is disrespectful. One of the most dangerous stories we've been told is the one that goes something like this. Humanity is a failed experiment. We are parasites, a cancer, a virus. Human beings are a disease. Really? Matrix footage? Was this video actually edited by a 14-year-old who did Illuminati once and now thinks he's taken the red pill? That moment when the hero rises from defeat, summoning a force they forgot they had. A force within. A force of nature. You know, the first 70 minutes of wet, stinky garbage in this documentary really had me think that I had my mind made up about this movie. But the last five minutes of cheesy, inspirational movie B-roll really changed my mind. Good job, Plandemic 2. I'm on your side now. No. Well, that's it. That is Plandemic 2 debunked in the books. If you made it through this video, thank you so much for watching, and I think I saved you about 40 minutes of your life because now you don't have to watch that awful, awful piece of film. I know that this video and the last video I made were definitely on the long side, but if you like this content, be sure to subscribe because my next few videos are gonna be a lot shorter, like five minutes short. So look out for those. Thank you so much for watching. This has been Debunk the Funk. I'm Dr. Wilson, and join me next time where I'll be debunking some more funky stuff. See you then.